Good morning, happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, man, busy Friday coming up. Um, the Intensive 16 is underway. We started last night. Um, today is the unlearning day, the day of discomfort, the day of frustration, and the day of struggle. Um, so looking forward to that. Uh, speaking of the Intensive, the Intensive 17 attendees have been notified. So if you apply for that, please check your emails. Again, only eight people can get in. Lots of great applications. This was a toughie. We, we, had, a, we had a big tiebreaker uh, last night to try to decide on the, the last person to come in. So again, tough decision, always difficult, but appreciative of everybody's interest in the intensive. And uh, for those of you who did make it in, um, please respond ASAP so we can get that rolling and get your preparation started for the Intensive 17. Digging into today's Q&A, this is with Matt. Matt had a great foundational question. It started off as a question about fascia specifically. It turns into a discussion of connected tissue behaviors, muscle position, and joint position, and how you can distinguish between whether you have a connective tissue sensation or a normal excursion of joint range of motion. So it'll be very, very useful for a lot of people who have difficulty still distinguishing between connective tissue behaviors and muscle behaviors. So thank you, Matt. If you would like to participate in a 15 minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Please put 15 minute consultation in the subject line and include your question in the email. We'll arrange that at our mutual convenience. Everybody have an outstanding Friday. Um, again, Intensive 16 underway. Very excited about that. You guys have a great weekend. I'm going to have a great one. I'll see you next week. So I've got a question that probably is a fundamental question that relates to Zach's in respect to um, connective tissue. But I'm trying to take a bit of a dive into fascia and understanding that. And I'm having a, a good deal of uh, difficulty trying to <clears throat> figure out how that works in respect to muscle actions and, and how what that interplay looks like. And one of the main reasons that I'm having difficulty with it is that, uh, that the network of fascia, as opposed to a muscle where we can see an origin and an insertion, and we can see a, a, like maybe a clear line of pull that causes a rotation, whatever it might be, fascia, because it you know, affixes in so many different places, and across so many different parts of the structure, it becomes really difficult to figure out when you're moving in a particular direction, what's pulling where, and then what's, you know, what's countering that. And I think the main difficulty that I'm having with it is that looking at it from a sort of a fluid volume shift, like we do with muscle, you know, we, we compress fluid and we can um, reduce the compression and expand uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. If we were taking that same principle with fascia, which is hydrated as well, the bit that I have difficulty with is, say we're looking at that elastic band representation of, of, of uh, connective tissue. Uh -huh. How does that play out with fluid dynamics? Like how does that, you know, because obviously we're not compressing, if we're pulling on it and it's, it is creating tension by pulling against the structure, then there's got to be a pull in, a, in another direction, which is, which is, you know, causing it to return or is it because it's, it, it's non, it's not like a, comp it's not compressible. Is it? I, I'm trying to get that around my mind. Whereas, you know, like a muscle expands and contracts. So we can see, I could, you know, I can picture that as far as um, pressure is concerned, but I have difficulty with the, almost like the one way notion of, of we get the expansion, we come back to a midpoint, but then what happens after that? We have another bit of fascia that pulls past that and moves to the next point along the line. Is that, it, it, does that make any sense? That's a convoluted question, I know. Um, how about we go with maybe for a second? Okay. Um, are you trying to figure out how the tension translates from one place to another, or are you trying to look locally at like a like a like a compartment, like a muscle compartment would be like a like a almost like a um, a bag of, of like fascia would be the bag, and then the water would be within it. Like where where are we here? Are we trying to look at something like yeah? Local? So probably probably a 
a bit of both because it's not it's not clear to me that if you it's not clear to me that like say if we looked at gait for instance and we looked at an early representation of a left leg walking forward uh -huh. and, then, and then we see okay so we might have a um on the earliest phases before the foot hits the ground we might have a uh you know concentric yield if my memory serves me no concentric overcoming on the posterior side of the hip it's moving a, through. Yeah. So if we've got that in place, yes. so we've got a, when the, the overcoming is coming from a certain, uh, a certain direction of the connective tissue, there's got to be, there's, I'm trying to figure out how that, how that works rather than just looking at a tendon and going, okay, it's attached to the muscle and it pulls in this direction and we can yep. see that directly. Yep. But yep. the fascia is overlaid over so many, areas and pulling in yeah. such different directions yeah. and trying to figure out how that comes together. Have you, I know you won't have a short answer for me, but if you have no, a like, reference I that care. I can look at or something. Um, yeah. Have you ever, you ever held a water balloon in your hands? Yeah. Awesome. So you squeeze the water balloon at one area and then the rest of it gets bigger. Yes. Okay. That makes sense to you, right? Yep. hundred percent. Okay. So Fascia does the same thing. So fascia would be the water balloon itself. Anything inside of that fascial compartment would be the water that's inside the water balloon. And then you have muscle activity that's going to alter the uh, compressive strategies and the tension through the connective tissues itself, right? So that's gonna, uh, based on rate of, of load, that's gonna create the yields and the overcomes. So the, so the fascia is no different than any other tissue other than the fact that it's a little bit more irregular in, in its design, right? But it is all encompassing of every, like everything's wrapped in it. And that's for a reason, that's for sensory purposes. But, but, but the point is, it's like, as far as the connective tissue behaviors, it's no different than anything else, but you got to look at it as like a sheet of connective tissue versus like a strand of connective tissue, like comparing a tendon to fascia, right? They're the same stuff. Right. Um, if you had a uh, a bed sheet, okay, that was say made out of rubber, and and you got four people on the corners and they're all pulling it tense, and then you take a bowling ball and you drop the bowling ball into the middle, you would see it deform, and it would deform more around the bowling ball than it would at your hands, but it would all deform. So there's always tension through the system. It's just that when I increase tension in one area, another area is gonna to have to stretch and allow that area to take up the, 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 the tension. And so you would have movement through the connective tissues in that manner based on shape change. So all, we're still talking about shape change, right? You're just looking at these broader areas, right? So if, you, uh, if you're doing like an, an RDL and you were to look at say the hips, so the posterior hip, Okay, and, and let's just say that we, we were looking at the fascia that was covering like glute max or whatever, okay? Would that, would that fascia be in an expanded representation? Would it be yielding under those circumstances? Yes. So you understand that, right? Yeah. Okay, and then when I finish the RDL and my hips go forward, what would happen to that connective tissue? Well, it would have to, it would have to return to its, to its I don't know if you want to call it a neutral position, whatever it was. The the, the you could just say way. starting conditions, or starting or conditions. you would say you would say relatively, it's in an overcoming representation, right? Yeah. So the thing yeah. the thing you so uh, have you you know what a tensegrity structure is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about tensegrity here. Is that is like there's always tension through the system, and is the minute I take up slack anywhere or produce a higher tension something else has to move in response to it and that like i said that's kind of what we're talking about here and then as you release those if, if you re release those everything will snap back to its initial conditions it's just like if i take my skin on the back of my hand and i pull it up like that you can see it stretch right and i let it go and it kind of goes back to where it was and when you get really old like me it's a little bit slower than when you were 25 but but point being is like it does go back into its original shape but that's, be, that's because of the, all of the tension through the system at the same time, everywhere is connected to everything else. So is it fair to say that 
is it fair to say that if you were having, say, for instance, you've got someone that's got an injury and they put an arm in a, a sling or, or something of that nature that res restricts their movement for a period of time? Yeah. I understand the fascia remodels, uh, you know, relatively quickly as far as uh, a change in positions uh, concerned. It, it can remodel to accommodate the, the new position. Um, when we undo the sling after, let's say, six weeks or, or whatever, uh -huh. um, albeit that the muscles change position of the joints, if that if it, 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 is that one of the reasons that they they're chasing range of motion um, sort of relatively vigorously. In other words, trying to return it to as, as much range of motion as possible as as early as they can in order to. Um, make those changes to the fascia so that they don't remain a like a you know a permanent restriction in in movement or there's not well, you're, yeah you have that, over the you other. Have, yeah you have that concern with all of the connective tissues though it's like like let's let's not give fascia more value than it deserves right yeah I mean it's important it's very helpful like I said it's a so fascia is this giant suit of sensors it's filled with sensory information right that tells your brain where you are in space right so it's useful and very and, and and very necessary um it does adapt uh, but but all the connective tissues are going to adapt under those circumstances and so it's like it's like we're not going to single out fascia as anything that would be more important because it's going to be included in everything because it's attached to everything right everything's wrapped in it from bone to every every organ right is contained within it yeah you yeah. know, so oh, the main, it, the is main an thing is it is an influence. It's just not terribly special. Yeah, I know. I've just seen some interesting changes in things like ranges of motion by, you know, if you want to call it trigger point or whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, pressure pointing one particular part of what, what, you know, Thomas Myers kind of book on anatomy trains and fascial lines and all that sort of gear. Yeah. And you, you get a response to say, um you know I've, I've seen increases in like um tibial translation or if you wanted to call it like a, a, a the the old needle wall the old needle wall test I know what you're about. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah by that by you know applying pressure sort of in uh, pretty close to the belly button somewhere around that region on externally and seeing quite significant significant increases in range of motion with no you know stretching of the other region at all um and, you know, it just interests me that you can have these changes in non-localized regions. And I expect that the fascia has some application for that or that, that, that that's occurring as a result of, of that, you know, transfer along that fascial line, if you want to call it. Does that make any sense to you? Well, so if, if, <laughs> if fascia covers everything, like everything, everything, right? It's one big piece. It's continuous. Yeah. Can't I just make a line anywhere that I want if it's all continuous? So is there really such a thing as a fascial line? <laughs> I guess. No, but there are relationships. So hang on. But there are relationships that produce the... So when I talk about helices, helical angles, ERs and IRs, that's what we're talking about. It's like it's like there is, there is a, a pathway, if you will, that will alter that in very specific manners, just because of the way that we are physically structured. And so that's what you're influencing more than anything else. So, you know, if you tickle somebody's belly button and they get more, more, uh, they get the knee gets closer to the wall in that little thingy that you're doing. It's like, all you're doing is you're promoting a, a systemic change that allows you to capture a middle propulsive representation of everything. Right. I'm influencing the tension in the system in a favorable way that allows me to access the space. There's nothing magical about a fascial line, if you will. You're providing yeah. a sense, you're all you're providing a sensory input that promotes a change in the system to allow it to acquire a space. Right? The fascia will behave as it, it will behave based on the rest of the system. It is not, it, it does nothing in isolation by itself. And so would that be connective tissue Everywhere. related? Sorry? Well, some of it is, yes. But if yeah. the joint, think about this, if the joint position changes, right? 
that becomes muscle orientation. And I'm not talking about stretching. Like if you feel mm -hmm. a sensation of stretch, okay? If you feel the sensation of stretch, you are pulling on connective tissue. If the joint changes and there is no sensation of stretch, that's a change in muscle orientation. So, so that's how you distinguish between the two is that like when I talk about eccentric oriented muscle, that allows the joint to change the position without any tension on it. That's how you distinguish them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling the pull, guess what you're doing? You're yanking on connective tissue. So you're either at the very end of the excursion of a joint where the, where you do have full eccentric orientation of a muscle, or you still have concentrically oriented muscle and you're pulling on connective tissue. You just have to look for the joint shape change to distinguish what is going on. You have to pay attention to the sensation to determine what is going on. Okay, cool. Does that help you at all? I think so. I think so.